Can't get the one yet? No, Hello, and welcome to None of the Above. My name is Steve Nemirovsky, and I'm your host. None of the Above is a political program. We talk about why our political system is dysfunctional and polarized, and we always try, try and talk on every show about solutions. What are we going to do about it? Every once in a while, I, I like to get a little bit outside the box, and we're going to do that today, because I've been reading more and more lately and hearing stories lately about the decline of democracy, quite frankly, across the world. Um, some people think it's a result of actions that are occurring in the United States, and some people think it's just stuff going on in the rest of the world, whether it's related to immigration or whatever the issues are. But there's definitely a decline in democracy, and uh, I find this troubling, and I wanted to talk about it. And I ran across an old friend, Mike Abramowitz. Uh, I've known Mike for quite a while, and uh, he's a great guy, and he's landed a place called Freedom House. He hasn't just landed there, he's the president of Freedom House. And one of the goals of Freedom House is to study the world, what's going on in the world in terms of freedom and democracy. They write annual reports, they do some fascinating work. So I wanted to drill down today and visit with Freedom House, Michael Bromwitz, and talk about their work and, again, get you educated on what's going on, not just in the U.S., but around the entire world. So, Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, great to, have, great to be here, Nemo. So, Mike, you and I have known each other for a while, but uh, we just caught up a few weeks ago in D.C. when my daughter was in town, and I was hearing more about Freedom House. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you ended up in Freedom House, and then tell us, we'll start talking about Freedom House itself. Sure. Uh, so I've been at Freedom House now for just over a year, uh, but my background is, a, is as a reporter and journalist. I was for almost 25 years a political journalist at the Washington Post. Uh, I covered uh, local and national politics. I was the national editor for a while. My last job at the Post was at the, uh, as a national editor. And I'm sorry, as a, I was national editor, then I was a White House correspondent under the second term of George Bush. And obviously we can talk about journalism has changed a lot. And I left the post around 2009 and I worked for eight years in senior positions at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And I came to Freedom House uh, to run the show here uh, in, in, in early 2017, just after the inauguration of Donald Trump. So what, what caught your attention about Freedom House? I know you've been very successful. You had a great career. Obviously, you decided to make a switch. Something about Freedom House must have uh, excited you. Well, a number of things excited me, but I would say the thing that was most in interesting to me was it was really an opportunity to work on what I think uh, is one of the most serious problems in the world today, which is the decline of freedom, the decline of, of democracy, which, as you said, Steve, in your introduction, is a global phenomenon which we can talk about. Freedom House is one of actually the oldest uh, pro-democracy organizations in America. We were founded, believe it or not, in 1941 by a group of individuals who were quite concerned about the, uh, the rise of fascism in Europe, uh, the rise of communism. They were particularly concerned about what was then called the America First Movement. There's a new America First Movement today, but the America First Movement then wanted to keep America out of the European war. And Freedom House basically came into being under the patronage of, uh, of Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie, who was a Republican who had run against uh, when, uh, Eleanor's husband, FDR, in the 1940 elections. And we came, across, came together on a bipartisan, really nonpartisan basis to advocate for policies uh, on behalf of democracy and freedom. And that's the history of Freedom House. And uh, today we're about a 150 people organization. The thing we're probably best known for is our annual surveys of political rights and civil liberties in the world. We've been doing this for almost 50 years. It's called uh, Freedom in the World. And, uh, but we also have a lot of other programs we do. Uh, we support human rights defenders and human rights activists who are working in, uh, in troubled uh, countries around the world. So uh, we do a range of things. We can get into that depending on what you're interested in. And you actually have a very large field organization. You have people located in many countries to study what's going on in those countries. Yes. Uh, we work abroad in about 25 different countries. We have, uh, uh, in some countries, we have you know, a, a, a staff presence. In other countries, we have people going in and out. Uh, we also, um, uh, in some countries we work, but we can't really talk about what we do publicly because it would put our, our people at risk. 
Uh, but we we basically run a ser- we run different types of programs to support uh, the aspirations of the human rights community. We help we help them uh, document human rights abuses in their country. We provide emergency aid for those who get in trouble. And one of the real phenomenons that you've seen over the last uh, uh, ten years or so is that uh, one of the one of the things that authoritarian countries do is they try to really crack down on on on, on, on civil society and make it hard for them to operate. And so we're trying to, in, in our own small way, you know, support the aspirations of civil society. Now, I know you have a press background. Do most of the people you have work in other countries, do they have a press background or it's like an investigative background, so to speak? No, no, no. It's a, it's a range of different things. We have some people with a press background, but we also have people who kind of, uh, Came come from kind of the development community and have worked on help on you know running programs in other countries. We have people who are kind of human rights activists, people who really know you know how to document and 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 uh, protect human rights and can advise people others about how to do that well. Uh, so we have a range of different expertise. Uh, you know we we do have some former journalists here. I'm one of them, but but I'm not the only one. And at the same time, you're I guess you're periodically or consistently collecting data, data about how you define the existence or lack of freedom in a country. Right, right. So that's really the core thing that Freedom House does, that we we produce an annual uh, survey called Freedom of the World, which came out uh, just about four or five months ago, uh, rating 2017. And we put that together uh, with a staff, you know, really with uh, with our own staff, but we also work with uh, researchers and consultants in about a hundred different countries uh, who are, you know, reporting on the uh, conditions uh, regarding political rights and civil liberties in their own country. Now, as I said, as you said, you started in 1941. You've kind of morphed a little bit over the years. For how long have you been studying specifically this aspect of freedom in other countries? Our report started in 1972. That was the first year of freedom in the world, and we've been doing it for now, I guess, 45 or 46 years. A few years after that, we also started doing uh, Freedom of the Press, uh, which is uh, another report that we've done. Also, a, a more recent report that we do that is really, I think, quite interesting, especially given you know trends in uh, technology, is Freedom on the Internet which looks at uh, how governments are uh, uh, controlling and repressing freedom on the internet. And then we also do other studies, like we did, we do one annually looking at the, stat, the status of democratic development in the former Soviet bloc. That's called Nations in Transit. And uh, I mean, I think that one thing that kind of is a common thread through all of our reports is that I would say that over the last decade or so, maybe a little bit more, you've seen a lot of pressure, downward pressure, on political rights and civil liberties. So for instance, if you look at freedom in the world, uh, over the last 12 years, you've had many more countries suffering a decline in uh, political rights and civil liberties than those in, in having an in, having a, a improvement. Uh, so for instance, in 2017, you had 70 countries recording declines, and you had about 35 recording improvements. So this has been going on now for about 12 years, and we can talk about some of the specific countries, but I think some academics have pointed to the Freedom House data and said, you know, we're in kind of a democracy recession. Or uh, another way of looking at it is that, you know, at the end of the Cold War, uh, even before the end of the Cold War, there was this so-called third wave of democratization, where many countries have... um, have been uh, becoming uh, democracies, uh, former dictatorships in Latin America, the former Soviet bloc, uh, and 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 so you had a really a steady democratization that kind of ended around 2005, and now for the last 12 or 13 years you've had a pretty much of a downward trend in these. Now, in the big picture, uh, there are many more democracies in the world now than there were in 1941 when we first started. So. You know, it depends what your baseline is, but but things have been going in a bad direction for the last twelve or thirteen years, and if it's not halted, uh, we would be quite concerned about that. Yeah, how how do you go about defining and setting the parameters for your definitions? Do you have a a committee that continuously looks at how to define freedom, how to define democracy? Um, how, how does that come about? Yes, 
Yeah, no, we work very closely with academic experts and experts on this. Um, what we do basically is that, and this and this methodology has been kind of uh, uh, developed over the course of you know time, but it's pretty. One of the things we like about it is that it's been pretty stable, and so you can really get a good picture of the uh, of, of 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 the longitudinal trends. But essentially, um, we are looking at what we define as political rights uh, and and civil liberties. So, you know, things like are there free and fair elections? Uh, uh, is the you know is, does the government represent the will of the people? There are 25 different indicators that we look at. And by the way, we about a year ago we brought in some of the top academics, you know, to look at our methodology, and they said, you know, this this works. So we basically are, are asking questions about the political rights and civil liberties experienced by the people who live in a country or in some cases a territory. Uh, and, 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 and what happens is that we, uh, we have an on-the-ground researcher who takes a first cut at sort of an assessment of how the country did, and then we have basically a dialogue with the Freedom House staff and other experts, and at the end of the day, after a process this last couple months, you end up with kind of a consensus score. And, and the way the system works, they're not like really major, you know, oscillations on a year by year basis. You see the slow improvement or the slow decline in, in the status of political rights and civil liberties. Do you get much pushback from people who say that, hey, wait, th these scores aren't right, democracy's flourishing, uh, you guys aren't looking at the right data? You know, it's a good question. We definitely get pushback from the bad guys. So one of the things that's quite interesting about Freedom House is that because our scores get a lot of attention, uh, we have you know countries that are basically authoritarian in nature, often criticizing us uh, because they just they don't like to be embarrassed or uh, uh, they push back for for for, for reasons of uh, of of of. of containing bad publicity. So I would say, though, that by and large, scholars and academics and experts do feel that our scores are, are, are basically sound. Um, th th there's no question when you're analyzing 200 countries a year, you're looking at 24 different indicators, a lot of different questions. You know, we're going to get things wrong from time to time. I'm not going to say we're always perfect. But, but, but I think over time, our scores and our, our judgments have, have held up, and they actually, you know, there are other people who do this kind of analysis every year, you know, like The Economist, uh, The Economist uh, magazine in Great Britain, they have an intelligence unit that also looks at scores, and, and, they're, and, they're, and their measures of democracy very much track our measures. I mean, I think, you know, for instance, what I'm saying to you about there being like a, Democrat, a democracy recession is pretty well accepted among, among experts. Now, now, my sense is a democracy recession, and my definitions, of course, may be different. But one of my complaints back home in the U.S. is our voter turnout is horrible. And, yes. And we, we get no turnout whatsoever. And I pick up the paper today, that they had the elections in Turkey, and they had an 87% turnout. Now, that's a country that, based upon a lot of different measures, is arguably in decline in democracy. But they have an 87% turnout for their elections. So they may point to us and say, hey, wait a minute. At least our citizenry comes to vote. You don't even vote in America. How can you judge us? Well, I think I think that's a I think that's a valid concern. I mean, you're raising a couple different issues there, Steve. I mean, I would say one thing would be that one thing that I'm very proud about with Freedom House is that we always, you know, take a uh, hard look at ourselves. Right? We're not going to just be judging what Turkey and Russia and Venezuela and the Philippines and South South Africa say. We also, in every one of our reports, we always analyze what uh, the status of freedom in the United States, and um, and we have been concerned about you know the general trends over the last, I would say six or seven years. This this did not start with uh, President Trump. You know we, we had we had concerns about things that happened under the Obama administration as well. I mean we really. I mean one thing I should say about freedom, House, just as an aside before I forget, I want your viewers to know. We are a fiercely nonpartisan and bipartisan organization. You know, right now, um, you know, we've had uh, Republicans chairs of the board. Right now, we have a Democrat, but it goes really back and forth. And uh, we really, 
people kind of check their party at the door when they come to serve on the Freedom House board. We really are very, we believe in that. But I think your general point is right, that uh, we do take a look at what ha what's happening in America. And, and I think what's happening in America you know, does make it difficult sometimes for us to make pronouncements about other countries. So I, 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 don't, I think that's a valid point. I will say that I think you have to put this in context. While there are clearly problems in U.S. democracy, and we can talk about that if you like, I think the truth is, is that we still have a very, compared to other countries, we still have a very vibrant and robust democracy in our view. You know, we still are, you know, we group countries in three categories, free, partially free, and not free. You know, the U.S. is still in the free category. We still have um, very Let's high hope scores we always relative, stay there, right? <laughs> relative to other countries. So, you know, I think that, yes, you know, President Erdogan can complain about voter turnout or point to voter turnout. But in the United States, as much as we're concerned about certain things, we're not throwing journalists in jail. We're not imprisoning our political uh, rivals. Uh, we are not, you know, kind of rigging the system to make sure that you can stay in power for for years and years. So I think uh, uh, you got to have some context in looking at this. So that, that brings up a good point. You have all these different measures, and you indicated um, earlier that you have this new phase of looking at the use of technology and artificial intelligence. How has that affected your studies over the past few years? Well, I think that, you know, I think the area that is the most, uh, the area that's the most relevant is, you know, we do measure kind of freedom on the Internet, uh, which is, uh, this is our newest survey because we just recognize that, you know, there's so much change happening in technology that, um, that, uh, that we had to kind of really take a look at, like, really, what, how, how can governments use technology to kind of infringe on freedom? And it's interesting, Steve, because I think when the Internet, you know, first became a, a thing, you know, maybe, what, what, 10, 15 years ago, it was really seen as a liberating technology, right? That it was really seen, like, for instance, in the Arab Spring in, the, in 2011, it was seen as an organizing tool by human rights activists in Egypt and other countries to kind of uh, um, uh, protest against their, their government's practices. Uh, it was really seen as a positive thing. And I think, I think we've seen in the last couple of years the fact that it's a double-edged sword, right? Is there still very good things about the Internet? But it also offers an opportunity uh, uh, for governments to, uh, to 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 repress freedom, to rep things, to basically, you know, limit limit, you know, undermine democracy. I mean, I think, for instance, one of the key findings of our last report is that you see I mean, there's been a lot of attention in our country to the fact that the Russians, you know, tried to you know interfere with our democracy by undermining, uh, by, by using social media to sow discord and to, uh, and, and, to, and to kind of undermine democracy. That's, I mean, it's not just happening in Russia. Other countries are also manipulating uh, the internet. So this is a global phenomenon. And, uh, we're, uh, and, and I think, it's, I think it's, going to take, it's going to take a while to sort out, but I think it's posing very serious challenges because how do you regulate this? Do you want to, I mean, like, are you comfortable with if Facebook were to, you know, uh, you know, regulate speech in a way? We don't like it when uh, the government does that, but is it okay for a tech company to do that? I think it's raising a lot of profound questions that are going to be sorted out, and that I, candidly we don't have all the answers to yet. And uh, I know you're measuring governments, but when you bring up tech companies, do you think you have to start measuring companies too? I mean, obviously. Facebook and Google, some of these companies, they screen stuff all the time, and they decide what you get to look at. That probably has an effect on the overall uh, freedom that you see people having in different countries, too. Absolutely. And that's a very valid point and something that I've thought about a lot because our report really focuses on, on government um, manipulation, censorship, control of the Internet. And I, and I think that's an important issue. And, and that's kind of our angle into this. There are others, for instance, a woman named Rebecca McKinnon, who's at the New, the New America Foundation, 
you know, she's been doing a rating of, of, of companies for how they uh, deal with freedom uh, and, and democracy issues. So there is there are other indices that look at those kinds of questions. I think at Freedom House, we've always looked at governments in particular, but I think you're raising a valid point, which is that, you know, the, the, the role of these tech companies can, in fact, contribute to either an improvement or a diminution of our freedom. So you found generally there's been this 12-year decline in democracy freedom, however you define it. Uh, it's probably ongoing. Um, I'm wondering if this is similar, though, to other periods in history. In other words, this kind of relates to the Great Recession and the fact there's been recessionary problems, and we have not had full recovery from recession, as far as I can tell. It also relates to massive periods of immigration. Are yes. these common historic triggers that people take advantage of to repress freedom and democracy? Well, I think, look, I think you've just hit on two things that I think about a lot. Uh, economic, economic conditions and also immigration. You know, basically, you know, we have the world's biggest immigration crisis really since World War II going on now. And so I think it's, that's causing a reaction in, in, in certain countries and, and causing governments to take steps to, uh, that we believe could, you know, diminish freedom. And so, uh, you know, a period, you know, Steve, you and I have talked a lot about because I used to work at the Holocaust Museum is the 1930s, right? So the 1930s was probably the period of the greatest, uh, you know, economic calamity in the world, you know, in our memory. I wasn't alive then, but the Great Depression, you know, you had 25, 30 percent people out of work. You had people really questioning in America the, um, the, uh, the efficacy of the capitalist system, uh, really, for the, you know, in a, in a very serious way. And, and I think so it's not surprising to me that in that kind of environment, you had, uh, you had countries like Nazi Germany and others, you know, basically saying, hey, we can solve these problems with, you know, with more authoritarian, you know, dictatorial approaches. And so I think you do see, uh, so that would be an, that, that, you know, that, that's a historical point that I think about a lot. I think we're in better shape than we were in the 30s today, but I think there are reasons to be concerned about the trajectory of things. Uh, so I, uh, I mean, I think, the, I think one point about democracy that I would say, and actually there's a very good book by Condoleezza Rice, who was the Secretary of State during... Uh, during the uh, Bush. Bush administration, you know, and she basically sees democracy, and I think it's right, as kind of a uh, imperfect system. We're kind of moving in some ways two steps forward than one step back. So, you know, it's not like, you know, we, we kind of have this assumption sometimes that history just plays itself forward. But in fact, if you look at the story of, of democracy, you see situations in which there's bursts of democratization, you know, followed by uh, a downturn. And I think, you know, we're now in, you know, a, a kind of a, rea a, a, the wave, the third democratic wave crashed and now we're in a period of downturn. And I hope we can turn it around. I mean, I think one country that I'm quite concerned about is, is, is China, because, you know, China, we uh, assumed uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago that this was, you know, as China became economically more liberal, opened itself up, uh, had a more capitalist system that political rights would follow. And that's not happening. And so China is really posing a very serious challenge to the rest of the world or for those who believe in democracy and freedom and these values because they're saying, well, you know, you can have uh, a, a, a capitalist system in which you can have economic growth in a system of kind of repression. And that you know, I think in the long term that's not going to work, but I think it's a challenge to those of us who really believe in, in these values. Now, now, one phenomenon I study on my show, we talk about demographics a lot and population shifts and things like that. We, we have something going on, in, perhaps across the entire world right now, we've never had before. We have these aging populations, and we do not have a young bases coming in that support them economically, et cetera, et cetera. Is there anything about these demographic shifts and aging populations that relates to any of your findings, or you haven't been able to think that through yet? Well, I, I certainly am thinking about it a lot. I mean, let me say a couple things. I mean, I think one interesting phenomenon, well, first of all, I think that one of the major issues in the world today is the fact that democratic countries like the United States 
like France, like Great Britain, and others around the world, but to say those three have been really kind of unable to deliver for their populations on a widespread basis, you know, consistent economic growth in which the fruits of that labor are really shared by uh, a broad cross-section of society. So that's generating a lot of political heat and some of the pressure, some of the anti-democratic pressures that we're talking about. And so I think that, um, you know, unless these countries are able to solve these kind of economic challenges, and I think the issue of the aging of the population is one of the, those economic challenges, it's going to make it harder and harder, you know, to kind of defend democracy in the long term, because people in the end want to see a, a system of government working for them. So I think it's one more pressure. The other thing I would say, Steve, is that if you look at polling about this issue, it's interesting, there is some suggestion in polling that young people are less attached to living in a democracy than their than their uh, than their older than their parents and their grandparents. So, like the farther you get from those who are close to the Cold War totalitarian settings, the less value is being attached to living in a democracy. Now, there's a lot of debate about that, and some people say that's overblown. But if young people are turning away from democracy, that would really be a very serious problem uh, in the long term. No, I, I've seen those studies, and, and they're very, very scary. So, Mike, time, Mike, time always flies uh, with my guests, and you're an old friend, and time has flown for us. Uh, but before we have to run here, tell my viewers how they can find out more about Freedom House, learn more about your work, get your reports. Well, just come to our website, www.freedomhouse.org. Uh, that's the best way. We, we, we put all our reports online there. Uh, we're actually, one of our big projects for the next year is we want to, we want to create a more interactive database so people, uh, you know, students and others can can search the reports more easily. That's a big priority for me. But come to our website. We have follow us on social media uh, at Freedom House or on Facebook. Uh, we're constantly putting out information. We actually have a very interesting poll. We haven't talked about it, but maybe next time, Steve, we have a poll we're, we're releasing tomorrow with the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas and also the Penn Biden Center, which is a public policy arm for, for Vice President Biden. It's a poll of American attitudes towards democracy. And in some ways, it's going to show a mixed picture where people, uh, I think, are very committed to living in a democracy, but they also uh, are worried about the, tra are worried about the trajectory um, of things. And I think if you come to Freedom House tomorrow, you'll be able to find a link to that poll, which I would really urge you to look at. Well, Mike, you're a great guest. You've given me an idea. I think we should do this interview at least once every year and figure out where we stand in the world in terms of freedom and democracy. That would be great. We can do it every year after we release our report, and we can go over the findings in depth. Awesome. Thanks, well, Steve. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you for watching. As always, our goal is to educate you. Uh, we try to provide solutions. I don't know if we found any solutions today for this decline in democracy, but just getting you to think about it, read about it, go to the freedomhouse.org website, and study what's going on in the world. Because uh, unfortunately and sadly, if it can happen in other places in the world, it can stop happening here. We're, we're the world's greatest democracy, but we have to fight for our democracy every day. We have to protect it. Remember, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. Thank you. Hello. 
Welcome to None of the Above. My name is Steve Nimorowski. We're visiting today with Mike Abramovitz from Freedom House. Mike and I just completed a terrific interview about Freedom House and freedom in the world and the decline of democracy. You can watch that on uh, Grassroots Television. It'll be available on my YouTube station at noneoftheabove.tv. And uh, there'll be a 